how do you balance it all? You know, imagine like running a multi-million dollar business with four kids and you know all these things and it's like you really need to be intentional. What do you want to do with your time? What type of life do you want to build? What type of business do you want to have? What type of impact? How do you want to tap in and use your strengths? Sitting with those questions, journaling, talking them out with people, and then sitting with your own heart and asking what you want. That's, that's the advice. Hello, folks, and welcome. Today, I am thrilled to be joined by John Roman in the Mastermind. John is a social entrepreneur, speaker, author, coach, and moment maker. He is the founder of the Front Row Foundation, author of the Front Row Factor, Transform Your Life with the Art of Moment Making, and hosts two podcasts, The Front Row Factor and Front Row Dads. So John, welcome to the show, my friend. Hey, thanks for having me, man. Yeah, I, I know that we've got a, a lot of friends that, and, and that uh, run in the same circles, and a lot of your friends have been uh, influential in my life and have been on this podcast, so it was a no-brainer to try to get you on, and I'm excited to be connecting. Um, and anybody who listened to that intro could tell that you're obviously all about the front row. So can you just tell us what the front row means to you? The front row, at this point, the front row m- means, I've been thinking about how I can sum this up in as few words as possible. I think the front row to me represents a lifestyle. It's a way of approaching my life and uh, and how I hope to include others in our community. And that is a life where we say the front row philosophy is getting close to the people, places, thoughts, and things that make you come alive. So if you live a front row life, it's uh, it's about getting close to something that lights you up, but that you can also serve, that you can participate with, that you can impact the moment with. So a concert is a great example, right? If you go to a show, you obviously are being entertained. You're obviously, you know, if you're front row to your favorite band, to your favorite team, to your bro- favorite Broadway play or anything like that, you're no doubt being entertained. But at the same time, you're not a total spectator. You're a participant. You know, you engaging, uh, you cheering, you singing along, you help create a moment for the person on stage. And uh, it's a very different feeling for a rock star to be on stage playing to nobody, to a stadium of empty seats, and to a stadium of those singing along to their favorite song. And so to me, the front row is a, uh, it's a choice of how we choose to engage in our lives and where we choose to be and who we choose to lift up and what we choose to be witness to so that uh, hopefully our hearts you know, uh, come alive to their fullest potential. And in doing so, we light up other people because when you're fully alive, you can't help but influence people around you. Yeah, it's an incredible analogy. I, I love your take on it too. Um, and I feel like so often people think of the rock star in, in that situation and how to be the rock star and really showing up and being part of that front row and bringing the energy really has an impact on the entire experience for everybody there. So I like that take on it a lot. Um, I have to imagine that a big piece of that is showing up and and living in the moment. And you talk about moment making. So what is your perspective on being present and in the moment when it comes to being, you know, part of that front row experience? Yeah, sometimes we're, you know, we, we all can be guilty of chasing the next thing. The next, yep. the next moment, the one that hasn't even gotten here yet. The thing that we think when we achieve it, we're going to be happy. Like if I could just get that house, if I could just get that award, if I could just get that car, if I could just get that girl or that guy or whatever, that we think when we are just about to get something or experience something, that that's where all of our happiness will be, is in the future moment. That uh, somehow it's something that lives outside of us. It's external. And I, you know, I've, but I'm constantly challenged. I'm challenged to this day to be in a space where I realize that uh, you can't take, you can't live tomorrow's moment today, right? You you can't. You can only live this moment. Now, what we do talk about is 
the three values of the front row organization are hope, celebration, and presence. And I look at life like a pendulum. It's it's like swinging through the moments. So we we look into the future. What's about to happen? And there's certainly nothing wrong with that. Certainly nothing wrong with having dreams or visions or hopes for the future. And hope is not a weak word. Hope in its most powerful form is something where we can look to the future and we can bring the power of possibility, bring it back into the present moment. Hey, I'm I'm hopeful that uh, you know I'll I'll make that Olympic team and I start working hard today. So that's how our hope affects our present moment. Same thing about when the pendulum swings in the past. It's hey, what worked? If we stick with the sports analogy, right, or going to the Olympics, it's like if you want to be the best at what you do, you need to look back and say, when was I at my best? You know, what did I eat? How did I sleep? What happened in the past that caused me to have my fastest time or my record, whatever? And we we notice little patterns in the past, things that we can catch and celebrate and say, oh, there was a win. That was let's do more. More of that. We experimented and that worked, had a good impact. Let's do more of that. So in celebration, we actually can bring past success into the present moment so we can do it again or refine it or, or give it another shot. So you're swinging from the past to the present into the future all the time. It all day long, in every moment, you're thinking about what's next, what just happened, and what's happening right now. Mm-hmm. And and all three of them are important. So you can't just live a life where you're fully present in the moment, I don't think. But I do think that you can keep coming back to the moment. And there's a muscle to be exercised there. It's like meditation where they go, look, meditation is about, it's not about staying focused. It's actually about losing focus and then coming back into focus. Mm -hmm. And every time we pull our focus back into the moment, we do a mental rep, an emotional rep. That is exercising our our focus, right? And so it's actually when we when we have that ebb and flow that we are doing the thing. And I think that life is the same way with living in the moment. You're you're flowing in and out of it. You're you're recognizing that at any second you can take a deep breath. And this is what we do. We're at a concert. We've been looking forward to it for weeks, and we're there. And we take a deep breath, and we look around, and we soak it in. Look at all the people. Look at the band, right? The, it's, an, it's an awakened, aware, present state of saying, look at what is happening. Isn't this amazing? And then it's being able to create in that moment when you know what's going on in a moment you can create. If, we are, if we're noticing what's happening, we can amplify those moments. We can um, add to those moments. That to me is, is what it's all about. That to me is what allows somebody to be a moment maker. What are all my resources around me and how do I amplify this? How do I make it better? Do we sing along? Do I invite somebody in? Do we, you know, you just think, you literally think about it like a concert. How can I amplify this moment? Maybe sometimes amplifying the moment is just being the best, uh, you know, participant so that you become an, you, or spectator so that you become an active participant, right? There's, there's that that happens when we lift somebody up, when we focus our attention, when we cheer, when we get engaged. No doubt. And and I think you're so right. There's so much power in being able to really bring yourself into the present moment and enjoy it and really recognize what's going on. As you talk about it, the example that comes into my mind is I got married last year and the best advice that anybody gave me beforehand was to, during your wedding, take a few times where you just step back with your wife, with your spouse, your significant other, and and just take in the moment, look around at all of the people who came together in one place just because they love you. And it's all probably the only time in your life that you may have that where every single person from all around the country and, and for us, it was the world come together uh, to celebrate you and, and you're just with them. And it's so easy on days like that. A wedding is a, is a good example of it's gone in a second. Anybody who's gotten married can probably tell you that, but it works the same with any type of experience that's really a, a joyful, um, pleasant time is that it's gone it's so quickly if you don't take a step back and recognize that yeah. present moment. Well, if you apply this to your work life, you know, if you, if you want to make an impact in the world with your profession, you, you need to be somebody that, that understands that swinging of the pendulum. You need to have a vision of what's possible. You need to be able to look back and see what worked. And then you need to be able to be present. You're in a conversation with a client 
If you're in sales, you're in a conversation with a client, you must be present. Mm. You must be listening. You must be watching the body language. You must be fully plugged in. Your heart must be connected to theirs. You cannot be living somewhere else and have a deep connection. We know it. You've talked to somebody before. I know everybody out there listening has talked to that person who you're at a party and you know when somebody's fully engaged with you and when somebody is looking over your shoulder to see if somebody else is cooler <laughs> in the room that they should be talking yep. to. We know it. So it's a very attractive thing. If you're in the dating space, it's very attractive for somebody that's fully present. You know, And we're not talking about staring at people to the point of being creepy. We're talking about being engaged. And that's what life is all about. People want to know that when you're there, they matter. I said, you know, I remember years ago saying, of the compliments I'd like to receive in my life, being a great listener is one of them. I would like for people to say when they're done talking to me that when they talked to John Vroman, they felt like they were the only person in the room. That there could be like dishes crashing from a plate, you know, somebody that dropped everything on a and you know uh, whatever, and I just just never broke uh, my focus with that person because when you were there, you're the most important person in the room. Yeah, that's so. It, it's a great point, and it reminds me of something that our mutual friend Jeff Woods says all the time: is be more interested than interesting. That's how you form true relationships, and that's how you get people to like you. Is you just are so focused on them and truly interested in that person that people can't help but be attracted to you and to your personality when when that's the energy you're bringing to any conversation. And I also wanted to to bring up a a phrase that's been mentioned a few times in this conversation, and that's moment makers. So, uh, what is a moment maker, and how does that relate to this whole thing? To, to me, uh, somebody who is a moment maker takes whatever they have access to and, uh, and, and turns it into something more, right? So, and what that might be is they might turn it into a memory. They might take a moment and turn it into a memory. A moment maker is somebody that would sit around a table at a birthday dinner for, for one of their friends. And a moment maker would... Uh, everybody's having dinner, celebrating somebody's life, and they would st- they would stop and they would say, "Hey, everybody, let's all go around the table and tell Sally what we love about her." A moment maker is able to take the resources that are available and turn it into something that wasn't already there. Moment makers are they they solve problems, they find opportunities. Right. And whatever that might be, um, a moment maker is somebody that asks the right question. It's that it, what you just said about Jeff Woods, you know, somebody who's really interested and they ask a question. And one of the most attractive things, I think, one of the best things, the most inspiring things that somebody could say in a conversation to another is that's a great question. Mm-hmm. Right. Like you can just see the gears turning and their and their heart lighting up. A moment maker is somebody that asks a powerful question. And you know what one of the most powerful questions is? What dreams are making you come alive right now? I can't tell you how many people out there uh, are leaders of teams and they're wondering why their people aren't performing at the highest level. And And if I ask that leader of the team, tell me your top five people on your team what their biggest dream in life is that they would not be able to say it. I can't tell you how many couples out there that if you ask a husband what his wife's biggest dream in life is right now that he would not be able to tell you or she wouldn't be able to tell you. Uh, and even parents of children who, if I said, what are your kids' biggest dreams? They wouldn't know. And kids, if I asked you about your parents, what are their biggest dreams? Like the question of what dreams are making you come alive right now, you know, uh, is, is one of the most important questions of all. So a moment maker is somebody that asks the question, how can I consciously create experience and celebrate the meaningful moments of life. Now think about that sentence or what I just said or that question. How can I consciously create, experience, or celebrate the meaningful moments of life for myself and others? So these are, what I just summed up in that one question is our three core values in front row about hope, celebration, and presence. How can I consciously, that's 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 intentionally create something in the future. I want to I want to do something to affect change in the future. I want to create it. it. Doesn't already exist. I'm going to make it happen, right? In a sense, um, experience, which means it's happening to me, and I'm just going to feel it, right? My wedding's here. I'm just going to look around mm-hmm. and soak it in, right? I'm going to experience it. 
Creating it was getting everybody there. Experiencing it is feeling everybody that's there, right? Consciously create, experience, and celebrate. And the celebration is looking back on it. The end of your wedding, looking back and saying, thank you, everybody, for being here. The celebration is, in many ways, gratitude of what has happened and the gifts that they gave us. So if we are moment making, we're doing all of those. We're getting people to our wedding. We are witness, we are we are acknowledging and soaking in that they are there when it's happening. And then we are thanking them for making the trip out. That is what a moment maker does. It is somebody who who invites somebody to their party, who loves them while they're at their party, and then sends them a thank you card for coming to their party. That's so cool with the holistic approach that you guys take on it of looking at it from past, past present, and future and placing equal importance in all of those. And the fact that with being a moment maker, it's not just about planning that out or um, having these elaborate kind of schemes or, or something like that, but rather whether you're in the moment, past moment, or leading up to the moment, you can be a moment maker based on what your reaction is or what your or what your initiative is going into the situation or living in it. So that, that's a really cool approach to it. For somebody to believe that they're a moment maker, they have to believe that they are making a difference in this world. And if you are breathing right now, right, you are making a difference in this world. If you have a heartbeat, you're making a difference in this world. Like there's not a person that was put here that's not going to influence others in some way. There is no, I don't make a difference. You're always making a difference, right? Even if you're playing the, I don't make a difference role, you're impacting somebody. Now, it might not always be the way that you want to, but you're always creating change. Right? There, there's no way for you not to create change. So you just have to choose how you want to do it. Right? If you're super negative and complaining all the time, you are impacting people. Just may not be in a positive way. So a moment maker, somebody who chooses to be a moment maker, just acknowledges the power that they have. Our whole lives, right? all the years that we get, however many any of us get, when none of them are guaranteed, right? All of, our, all of our lives are made up of years that are made up of months. And if you keep reverse engineering that, you go from months to weeks to days to hours to minutes, and minutes are just moments. And so if you want to live a great life, you're doing that one moment at a time. We need to be, we need to be managers of our moments and moment making all along the way, from the second we wake up until the minute we go to bed, and we get to choose how all of our moments are invested. Right? And you're right about the fact that it doesn't have to be elaborate. It can be very, very simple. You can make a moment by some, for somebody by just listening to them for 10 minutes. You can make somebody's day by giving them a hug. You can tell somebody, you make somebody's day by telling them that uh, you know, they're, they're a remarkable human. There's so many ways. There's countless ways. There's millions of ways for people to be moment makers. We just can't get in the business of comparing ourselves. Like, you know, our charity puts people in the front row of their favorite live event and they're elaborate things, right? There's certainly, it's their big moments in time. But I'm also not thinking that those are the only ways that I'm a moment maker in my life. Right? I, I went biking with my 10-year-old to school today to show him the route on how to drive, ride his bike to school next week for his first day. And to me, that was as special as any other moment in my life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're definitely going to talk about the foundation here in a second. But while we're on the topic of moment makers, how can, how can listeners think about this when it comes to entrepreneurship and, and starting a business? Because I know that you do a lot of work with entrepreneurs. You are one. A lot of your friends are and, and a lot of the folks that you work with are. So when it comes to being a moment maker, how can this influence your success in the business realm? Well, I'll give you, yeah, I mean, it's a great, it's a great question. And because there's so many different businesses that somebody could get into, I just need to pick one and give an example, right? And then you could try to apply this to whatever business you might be in or want to get into. But I'll give you an example but with Front Row Dads. So I run a dads group of high performing entrepreneurial dads. Uh, it's, you know, it, it, it is, they're, they're, they, our group is filled with successful people. There's a couple of things that um, we have done that when I apply moment making to my business, I'll give you a great example. In fact, I'll give you a recent example that happened in just the last couple of weeks. So I host the Front Row Dads podcast. And for a while, we were putting out just a Tuesday interview, right? I'd interview amazing people, put out the show on Tuesday. 
Then I thought, you know what? Let's let's start doing a. I'll do a solo show on on Thursday where I could just people were asking me like, what do you think, John? Like, I'd like to hear more about your opinions or whatever. So maybe you could just get on and rant a little bit. And I started to do that on on a Thursday show, but because I'm always asking the question of how can I be a moment maker? How can I how can I consciously create experience and celebrate the meaningful moments of life? That that question leads to other types of questions like that. In moment making in business, what you're really talking about is how do I make a difference to somebody? Because if you if you make moments powerful, time is valuable, right? And that's what people want. They want something that's going to give them value for their time that they're investing. And in my line of work, uh, as a podcast host, as an example, the podcasts need to be good. They need to be packed with value, right? They um, In my community, I've got paying members, dads that pay to be part of our community. I need to be thinking about them. And uh, and then I need to be thinking about my own energy level. Like I need to do things that are energizing because if I'm not having fun leading this thing, I'm not going to do it anymore. So if we can find the sweet spot and harmony between all these things, we can then be even more powerful moment makers because moment makers look around and take all their surroundings and create something amazing out of it. So I said, all right, listen, I don't love doing a solo show, but I think it's valuable for me to be able to offer maybe a little bit more of my insight through some conversation based on what my community wants. I want to get my community connected to each other. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to offer a show on Thursday where I'm going to get three of our members of Front Row Dads together for a conversation on a specific subject relating to fatherhood. And we're going to talk. So I'm going to not only build relationships with all these guys, things I should be doing anyway, I'm going to give them a chance to offer their opinions in a conversation, get to know each other. I'm building bridges between them. I'm getting to know them. I'm not experiencing the pressure of having to do a solo show. And we're going to record this thing and put it out on the podcast on a Thursday. And then other people who are listening to our podcast are going to go, man, those guys are, they have great conversation. They're authentic. They're real. That's what it's like to be part of Front Row Dads as part of the brotherhood. So now it's marketing our brotherhood. I'm connecting with the guys. I don't experience the pressure of doing a solo show. And we're putting out more content. And it's amazing. So moment making is about taking the moments we have and making them into something better because we're being intentional and smart about how we're utilizing the resources we've been given. That's what moment making is. And that's how it can impact our business because what I just gave you is like a way that I've used the moment making philosophy to do something that drives business forward. And I could give you hundreds of examples of that in varieties of industries, but this is my business and my industry, and those are the ones that are most relevant to me. And um, you know, that's uh, that's how that, that's how it applies. Makes a ton of sense, and just being able to use your time and those moments in a way that is going to be as impactful as possible and just enjoyable <laughs> at the same time. Um, so let's talk a little bit about. The foundation, the front row foundation. Is that what kind of started you down this front row path or was it the yeah. business first? Yeah, no, no, it was, it was definitely that. So I was, I was in, I, I had a corporate position, right? And just, I felt like, man, I kind of got what I needed out of life. You know, it's like when you get, I bought a house, I bought a car, I had a girlfriend and I had this job and I love my job. I love the company. But I remember just feeling like, okay, so is that it? <laughs> is this just do more <laughs> of that till I'm dead? Right. And then, you know, so you start looking for more. You start looking for like, well, okay, like what, what what's going to challenge me next? Right. Like, where do I go from here? And you hit those milestones. And I remember um, coming to the de- decision that contribution was where I needed to. What was not the bucket that what that wasn't the category that was a ten? Because if somebody were to ask me, all right, John, you got the job, you got the car, you got the the stuff, but now like, what are you giving to the world? Like, where's your contribution on a one to ten scale? Wasn't great, right? Did a lot for me. It was all about my next meal, my next adventure. It was a very selfish thing. Which, hey, look, it's no problem, right? Like, you guys are allowed to eat good food and you know travel right of course but it can't be it can't be it so contribution was it and i started paying attention 
Then you start noticing things. I went to a concert, Jason Mraz. I was in the back row. I looked at the front row. I was like, oh, life is different in the front row. And I said, you know, and sometimes in my life, I played in the back a little bit, played it safe. And I thought, oh, that's such a good metaphor for life. And that was just kind of hanging in my brain, this front row metaphor. And then my buddy challenged me to run a 53 mile marathon. And I was Dang. like, not even a runner, but I said yes, reluctantly. And then we're doing this training run and we're running eight miles for the first time this day. I'm struggling to find a reason to finish this 53 mile marathon. And he's like, we should raise money for a charity. I said, yes, that would bring more purpose to this. That would make all the pain more bearable. And then the conversation quickly turned to, well, hey, what if we started a charity? Right. And then it's like, oh, that's kind of a cool question. Like, what would you do? And it was just more fun. It wasn't even like we weren't even serious. We were just like, what would you do if you did start a charity? Like, what would you do? And then I started thinking about like my greatest love, my greatest fear, because I think that's where a lot of energy comes from. And my greatest love was moments and experiences and times with our friends. We tell stories about all these things we did. It's like one of the most important things in my life was creating experiences. And one of my greatest fears was dying young, dying early, like having it, like getting in my car, driving home and having somebody cross the median and it's done. Boom. That's it. That was all, that was all your time. You're out of here. And that was a fear of mine, right? Just having it end early because I just wanted to live the whole thing as much as I could. So I said, well, what if we helped people that were fighting for their life to have the best day of their life? And we call it Front Row Foundation and we put them in the front row of their favorite event. And I said, oh, the minute I said it, I was like, that's it. That's the, that's the thing. It was like, I knew. I just knew. I was like, oh, that's, I'm so in. So we ran the marathon. We raised the money. We started Front Row back in 2005. We got all our friends together for a, a fundraising event. 200 of our buddies showed up, you know, and, and, uh, and we did like c- c- comedians were there and we, we auctioned stuff off. We raised like 20 grand. And that was the start of it. We sent a woman named Effie Habucky to go see Brooks and Dunn that night. One of my buddies, Mike Habucky, it was his mom who was battling for her life. And we created this experience and she sent us this beautiful thank you card and told us the story about how she went to this event. She got to the the box office, you know, to pick up her tickets. And we knew the president of the casino uh, in Atlantic City. And and uh, he, we got the tickets from him. So they were front and center. They were like the tickets you can't buy, right? <laughs> and, 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 and Effie walks up to the counter and she's like, all right, here for the show. Here's our ID. And the, the ticket person slides the tickets across the counter and she goes, I don't know who you know <laughs> to have gotten these tickets, but holy cow, like front and center. Think about that. In the entire venue, there's only two front and center seats, really, really front and front and front and center, center, center. It's, there's only two of them. And if you've got those, you're like king of the world, you feel like, queen of the, you know, queen of the whole venue. And so anyway, we, we created this event. We were hooked and we just started doing more and more and more of them. So um, that was it. And you know that, that was the start of it all. But then once that started and I had this corporate position, I was like, oh man, like, what could I do professionally that would actually align with the charity? So I was like, I wonder if I went out, was a keynote speaker, I write books, I coach, I do all this stuff. I could actually be talking about living life in the front row and I could be using the charity to -hmm. tell the stories. So I'm getting paid for my business. Now, this is all separate, right? Like I have a for-profit front row global and I have a non-profit front row foundation. So at this time, keep in mind, I'm not getting paid from the charity, not taking any money from the charity. I am making money as a speaker. People are booking me and paying me to come speak. But the crazy part is I'm telling everybody about our charity. So I'm recruiting donors and fans and all this stuff, and I'm helping the charity to grow, and I'm getting paid in my business to do it. It's like the best of both worlds, right? Like every time I make money through my business, I'm helping the charity. And I'm also donating literally 20 to 30 hours of my time, donating to the charity. Because I'm helping the charity grow. I'm the executive director. I'm working my butt off for the charity. But I'm just, I'm in a position where I work for myself. I can do whatever I want. If I want to spend 20 hours a week working on a charity, I can. Because I'm, I'm in control of my life. I'm in control of my, my future. Boy, that was all awesome. Until the final part of the story is that I had kids and I don't want to travel and speak all over the place anymore. I did that, right? I traveled all over the world for 10 years. And uh, I was like, I want to stay home with my kids. So I started Front Row Dads. And now I just, I serve a community of men in front row dads and still front row brand. I mean, I've got front row tattooed on my arm. I've got fr- front rows everywhere in my life. Like my whole <laughs> world is front row. And to me, it's just a representation of how we choose to live our lives. Well, I think that a lot of people strive and for that 
that alignment in life to find something like that where you can apply yourself 150% towards this thing and it fills up all those buckets. And then as your life expands into new areas, i.e. having kids, i.e. getting married, i.e. starting the front row dads, you're able to align and expand this thing that you've created to what it is that changes with your interests, with your passions and, and how your life has changed. So it's amazing that you were able to create that. And it's something that really, no matter what life throws at you, you're, you're the type of moment maker that will be able to find the alignment in it and work it in so that you're still living your passion. And it's just very inspiring. Yeah. Thanks, Ben. Thanks. It's been a long journey. And I can tell you all sort by the way, and to respect all those entrepreneurs out there, or especially young entrepreneurs, new entrepreneurs, I gotta tell you, I left a job where I was making, you know, hundred grand a year and uh, feeling like I could pay the bills and the rent and the car and the food and all that stuff to quitting, right? Starting my own speaking career. And the first year I paid thirty thousand dollars to the world to call myself a professional speaker. Mm. The second year, I went even further in debt, right? Spent all my money, racked up credit card debt. The third year, I won Campus Speaker of the Year and made a hundred grand. And then the next year, I made two hundred grand. And then it was kind of history from there. But and I paid off my bills and all that stuff. But it was rough. They, I had a new baby. I was just married, and they were foreclosing on my house. Wow. So, I mean, I could tell you, and, and I share that because I just want to be really like honest. Like, there's some parts of the story right now that seem like super sexy. Like, oh, that's all you got to do. Just quit your job, start a charity, tell yourself <laughs> you're going to be a speaker, and like, boom, you know, you're getting 25 grand a speech. And as much as I'd like to say that was the journey, it wasn't. It was struggling and fighting and clawing your way, oftentimes, you know, through another day. And I loved it, man. I mean, there's, you know, look, as tough as it got, I still felt free. I still felt the freedom to build what I want. I was still charged by it. Doesn't mean like, you know, it's kind of like an MMA fighter. Like, you know, look, they don't, part, getting hit in the face is part of the job if you're an MMA fighter. But I don't think you go in there like begging to get hit in the face. Like, right. you want to win the fight. And uh, but yet getting hit in the face is kind of part of the deal. And if you're going to be an entrepreneur, you're going to get take some hits uh, along the way. And I just knew that was what it was. And I was kind of just like, you know, nothing's going to stop me. Like I got a dream, and if other people can do it, so can I. And I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna make this thing work. I'm gonna fight my way into the into the place where it's going to work. And, and I think that's the mentality you have to have. And I really appreciate you sharing that perspective of it too, because. That is where, you know, I'm at, where a lot of our listeners are at, where uh, they may be fired up about an idea or a project that they're working on, but those struggles are real, man. You know, the yeah. entrepreneurial journey has <laughs> has its ups and definitely in those early years yeah. has some, some downs and some things that you got to battle against, some internal demons you got to face, um, and, and, it, and it can be a challenge. So I'm glad that you shed some light onto that and, and thank you for being transparent and open about it. Oh, of course, man. Yeah. So what advice might you have for, let's say if you could hop in a time machine and talk to your younger self right before, you know, you embarked on that marathon, that ultra marathon journey. So before you had the, the idea for uh, front row foundation and before you, you really, everything's the, the wheel started spinning on this thing. Is there a piece of advice that you might give to yourself back then, knowing everything you do now? Man, that's so tough. To, it's such a tough thing, too. I, I've, I've processed this. I've really thought through that question. And it's a tough one because on one hand, sure, like there's things I could go back and say, look, if I went back with my brain now at 44 years old to when I was like, you know, when I really took the leap and left all of that, right? And because uh, it, was, it was actually, it was 11 years ago that I quit my job um, and, and decided to become an entrepreneur, 11 years. So if I could go back to that 11-year-old self or whatever age, I definitely would do things differently with the knowledge I have today. There's no mm -hmm. question, right? Like there's things I would have done differently. Um, but at the same time, like there's so many things I was doing that were just part of the process that I almost don't like playing that game. I almost don't like thinking about if I could go back. But I understand why you're asking. Because the real question is, if you ask people who are down the road, what should we do? What should we think about? How should we behave? How should we act? 
um, there is some valuable lessons in that for people who've who've traveled, right? And I think that, and everybody's path is so unique too that that I hesitate on giving advice on this is the next step because everybody's business is different. It's like one person should write a book, another person should do this, another per- it's it's very different for people, right? It's really hard to say. And when I look at all my friends, they all got to where they are today in different ways, right? But the one thing that I would do is I would advise for silence, for time to reflect. I would advise myself, I would advise anybody to get space and time to think about what you really want, what you really value, what you really care about, what is what you're willing to sacrifice, what you're not, what are your non-negotiables, all that. Just who are you really? What do you really want? What are you willing to trade and sacrifice or, right? Like that, all those things about who are you, right? What are your natural gifts? What are your natural talents? Follow that. Because even though people told me that, I still got caught up in like one buddy starts doing one thing and it looks like he's making money. And I'm like, maybe I should abandon my project and go do that thing. And then Mm -hmm. somebody else is like, you know, I mean, look, I, I helped Hal write the Miracle Morning book. Right. I, I actually I was I could have been Hal's business partner in the Miracle Morning book. I was his partner originally. And then I pulled out. Um, and that book has sold millions of copies. That book would have made me if I would have stayed in it, would have made me millions of dollars. But the good news is that I followed my heart. I don't look at that as a regret. I don't look at that as a fail or a missed opportunity. I look at that as like, hey, it was actually one moment when I did what I needed to do, which is just stick to what I was born to do, what my path was, what I was supposed to create, right? And I think that's what we all need to be doing. And even I need to give myself that advice today to make sure I have plenty of time to breathe, plenty of time to think. I had a front row dad's call earlier today and they were talking about how do you balance it all? You know, imagine like running a multi-million dollar business with four kids and you know all these things. And it's like, you really need to be intentional. What do you want to do with your time? What type of life do you want to build? What type of business do you want to have? What type of impact? How do you want to tap in and use your strengths? Sitting with those questions, journaling, talking them out with people, and then sitting with your own heart and asking what you want. That's that's the advice. Man, that is some powerful stuff. Uh, and I know we're wrapping up on time here, but we didn't even have a chance to dive into the book. I think we probably touched on a lot of concepts that are included. Yeah, in we it. did. Yep. Um, but for anybody who's interested, where uh, where might they learn more about you? And uh, maybe you could just give a you know a quick thirty seconds on the book and and what what that was all about. Yeah, the, here I can give one sentence on the book and it would it would sum it all up. The book is everything you can learn about living life from people who are fighting for it. Mm-hmm. So pick up a copy of the book, pick up a couple copies of the book, 100% of the profits support the charity um, and 100% of your money that goes to the charity helps a recipient. We have a group of private donors who cover all the admin and overhead costs for that charity, which is really cool. I would also say that, uh, I mean, look, frontrowfactor.com has everything. Uh, if, if, you know, I've talked about a lot of stuff, the charity, the business, the speaking, the dad stuff, it's all at frontrowfactor.com. You could check that out. But you have, if you happen to be a dad and you want to go straight to the dad stuff, frontrow.com, Dads.com. That's my that's my business now. Right? That's what I'm I'm all in on that. And I spend you know twenty. I, I spend half my week on Front Row Dads as a business. I spend half my week on Front Row, or Front Row Foundation as the charity. So you know I'm a hundred percent in on Front Row Dads as a business model, and I'm a hundred percent in for the charity when I'm focused there. And um, it's an awesome you know it's an awesome life. And if there's some way I can help people to you know to live their best life, then you know people should reach out. I'm happy to do it. I love it all. And uh, this was a conversation where, John, your reputation preceded you with all the great things I heard about you and and from people who I really trust. And and, uh, he definitely lived up to it. And so I'm so grateful that we had the opportunity to connect. And thank you for your time to come on the podcast and share some of your journey and, and the things you've learned along the way with our audience. We really appreciate you. Oh, man. Thanks for having me. Hey friends, I hope you enjoyed the episode. If you did, would you mind doing me an enormous favor? Could you drop a quick rating or review right there in your Apple Podcasts app on your phone? 
It helps so much in growing the show and helping more people find it. And when more people listen, we get better guests to come teach us cool stuff. It would mean the absolute world to me. Thank you so much, and we will see you next week.